Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to our friends in Europe. Good evening to our friends in Asia. Uh, my name is Tom Bridge. I'm the Principal Product Manager for Apple Technologies here at Jump Cloud, and I couldn't be more excited to join you all this morning uh, for an awesome uh, webinar experience. We're here uh, in Jump Cloud talking a lot about IT in 2021 and beyond, uh, with an emphasis on remote work and our zero trust future. Uh, and we've got an incredible panelist uh, set group this morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome Alex Hoff, the co-founder and chief product officer of Ovic. Alex, good morning. Good morning. We're very excited to be here today. It's been a while since Thanks. I've done one of these. <laughs> We're glad to have you. Uh, welcome also Gary Reiner, operating partner at General Atlantic and former CIO of General Electric. Good morning, Gary. Hi. Delighted to be here. Thank you, Tom. And uh, also welcoming uh, Antonio Wint, uh, CEO of Synac Finn in Denver. Good morning, Antonio. Good morning, Tom. Thanks for having me. Good to see you guys. We're really glad you're all here this morning. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about, so I kind of want to jump just right on in this morning. Um, and, you know, we've got a lot of questions here in 2021 about uh, the new way that we've been operating for the last 18 months and the lessons that we've learned uh, over the last uh, year and a half of being a mostly remote focused world. And so as we've walked away from offices be, for health and safety reasons, uh, you know, we've had to start to think about all sorts of new ways to work. So I want to talk with you each about your experiences over the last 18 months. How can you build as an IT organization a strong remote user experience for your end users? And uh, Alex, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, what it's been like at Ovic? Yeah. So. I'll frame this by just explaining a little bit about what Ovic does. Uh, it's not a pitch. It's more that we help with network management. And so my perspective of this is, is somewhat different than that of uh, some of the other panelists on here. I think about it personally. You can clearly see that I'm in my home today and what makes an awesome experience for a remote user as an IT person, frankly, not having second class citizens. And so for me, that is whether it's a, you know, you're on Zoom, you're on GoToMeeting, pick, pick your favorite tool, we all, talk to each other the same way. We all work on collaboration tools the same way. We don't have five of us in a room and then one person on the wall anymore. We all participate as one group. And it's super important that IT helps enable that. And so that's where you know tooling can come in to help make sure that I have a great experience because frankly, I may be a little bit more tech savvy than some of my other uh, counterparts, but you know, maybe maybe some of the other panelists can share their experiences. Gary, uh, what's yeah. what's your last 18 months been like? So, so I, I echo what Alex said, which is that, I mean, it's kind of like when you meet someone that doesn't speak your language and you tend to kind of, uh, you kind of discount what they're saying because they don't speak good English. I, I, it's so easy to discount people that don't have good connectivity, don't have a good web camera, don't have good connection. Uh, and one of those things is the, to the greater extent you can use broadband rather than Wi-Fi. Because uh, Wi-Fi is just nowhere near as as reliable as as as, uh, as Ethernet. Um, I do think, in terms of what makes for you know, you want to be as friction-free as possible with with your employees, and that means really you know comprehensive, but also easy MFA, and we can talk more about that. Easy SSO, but in addition, maybe a password manager in addition to SSO for all the things that people access. Um, easy ways, and we can talk about this, that uh, employees can use their own devices rather than the, the business owned devices. Um, uh, you know, knowing which data to encrypt, um, uh, basically knowing um, which devices as well as which people need to have serious multi-factor authentication. And my, all these things we can talk about more, but it, it's, uh, and then the last thing I'd say is really good application performance monitoring and security monitoring um, so that you as an IT admin uh, can know exactly what's going on, where there are problems and where there are problems that are likely to happen that haven't happened yet. But anyway, that's a bunch and I'm sure we'll get to most of that going forward. For sure. And Antonio, you know, as a practitioner in the community, making advisory decisions on behalf of your customers, what's your process been like over the last 18 months as you've evaluated what it takes to make a strong remote experience? Yeah, so we're a managed service provider based in Denver, Colorado. So we manage a lot of businesses and we um, deal with a lot of uh, different types of businesses. Um, 
ease of use is certainly the number one thing we're looking at uh, as far as providing a good remote uh, work experience for our team, but also for the clients that we serve. Um, never forget the human factor. I mean, why are we doing this? Um, it really comes down to there's technology, but this technology is being used by humans. So although in a perfect world for me, the most secure implementation of no access and everything disconnected from the internet would be great. That's <laughs> not, that's not how life is. So uh, we want ease of use, frictionless access. Um, otherwise, you, you know, your team is going to push back. They're going to try to find workarounds and ways to get around the solution that you're trying to put in place to protect them. Um, those are the number one things that we're trying to do for our clients uh, when designing solutions. Absolutely. So from there, you know, I want to take a focus on, we've learned a lot of lessons from the last year and a half. Let's pivot to talking about the future for a minute. What technology should we be focusing on in 2022 uh, and building around for the coming year? Uh, Gary, what, what are you seeing out there? I think three things um, to give you a really uh, secure environment. Um, one is uh, data encryption for all of the critical data. And we don't always do that. Um, but also having policies uh, around who can access what and basically easy way to impose permissions on who can have access. And if you have those two things, if you've got encryption at all the right levels and then data policies on who can see what, and then you connect that to a really good multi-factor authentication, you get those three things. And I think you've got about as secure an environment as you can have. So those would be the areas that that I would focus on from a security point of view. Antonio, how is uh, wh what are you thinking about for next year? Um, we're focusing on tools that are uh, heavy on machine learning and AI. Um, there's a that's the the next step. I mean, there's just too many threat vectors, and we're trying to protect too many different environments. Um, the perimeter is extended. Uh, we need help. So machine learning, artificial artificial intelligence is where we're going. Um, tools that are built on that technology we're looking at. Uh, remote support solutions, of course, are uh, critical for a managed services provider. Um, and then your number one threat, uh, your number one threat within your business or within your community is the user. So we're focusing a lot on cybersecurity training, uh, user training tools, and educating the teams that uh, we support so that they're less likely to make those mistakes. Um, notice I said less likely. It isn't impossible. You're not going to just completely remove the human element, but we want to make sure that they're educated and less likely. Alex, what are you thinking about for next year? I was joking that after AVEC one day, I'm going to have a coin operated car wash business so there's no humans involved, but that's a different joke. Um, I think when you, you know, for us, we look at the network, right? Uh, you know, Antonio has a unique perspective as a managed service provider because he's used to remotely managing many organizations, but when we talk to, um, you know, IT organizations within a, a company, they're not used to this. Antonio's been doing this for years, I'm guessing, and he's able to remotely administer, remotely manage, remotely control these things, but the network used to be on-prem. And now when I think about it a little bit differently, you get these IT people who are were scrambling to get everybody remote, they lost visibility into the machines, they lost visibility into the network, the definition of the network changed, the network used to be the, the blue wires between their PC and the switch. Now it's the broadband in their home, their Wi-Fi in their home, they're in an apartment building, they've got 600 access points they can see compared to someone who's in a rural country and they're just on ethernet and they have bad connections. So I think scrambling for visibility is something that we hear a lot. And yeah. I think that's where we're, we're going to see many vendors change the way they they look at traditional problems and, re and approach them more from a user experience point of view. Yeah, Just in a previous if life. Could, Tom, if I could add to that and, and, and both, of, both of their points, I think on the email side, you know, the phishing piece, as it turns out, about 90% of all breaches are start with a fish. Uh, and there are a lot of solutions out there that both educate uh, employees on how to recognize a fish and then also uh, use AI to Antonio's point uh, as a way to determine whether or not an email coming in actually actually is a fish. Uh, and then yeah. there are a whole bunch of point solutions, but let me just talk about them real quick. Um, you know, this is endpoint detection uh, and response. There, there's, there's network detection response to Alex's point. Um, and increasingly now there's, there, and maybe this is what Antonio's talking about, there's MDR, which is really taking in all of the data from all of the point solutions 
and using AI to figure out whether or not there really is a problem. Uh, and and uh, those are all things that you know we're seeing certainly mid and large companies deploy uh, pretty comprehensively these days. Absolutely. And you know, in my previous life, I spent you know fifteen years at an MSP. Uh, and the early part of the pandemic was all, our, our entire story was notifications. Our entire story was fixing home Wi-Fi. Our entire sto you know, story at that point was visibility into the fleet and making sure that everybody was still there. Uh, and you know, we started to, to essentially treat that almost as health monitoring, not just for the machines, but hey, you know, we haven't seen a check-in from this person in a couple of days, are they okay? Yeah. Um, and, you know, to, to essentially treat that as, as, as an IT a driven human solution um, was a really important part of that process for us. Yep. And there are a lot of players out there that are doing remote monitoring maintenance for small and medium sized businesses uh, and are also doing remote security monitoring for small and medium mm -hmm. businesses. So those, those, are, those are very, very important uh, services that are available as well. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, the concerns about remote work, because I feel like end user security practice has also been a huge story this year. Uh, and, you know, as we look at, you know, what the results of the Jump Cloud ITSME report, uh, you know, the top three biggest security concerns remain software vulnerability on uh, user endpoints, whether or not it's the company device or their personal. 37% um, said use of the same password across different applications. 36% said the use of unsecured networks or you know, networks that are, shall we say, built for the home. Um, and I, I, I think that that's where we start. So a, a, Antonio, you know, as you've seen this as an MSP, you know, how have you been looking at these concerns? Are, the, are, are you seeing something different than what our survey said? I know that is 100% accurate. And when we made the huge switch from um, supporting people mostly within a brick and mortar, uh, single perimeter environment to multiple perimeters, you can almost imagine it as a hub and spoke design with the office in the center and now all these adjacent offices now we have to support. The number one concern was the students and the kids went home also. And now we have a shared network environment with gaming PCs and school computers. And I'm trying to isolate traffic for the business to make sure that people coming in from that IP are only from the approved system. So yes, I mean, for, for us, the shared networks, the gaming, and, and all that was a major concern uh, for removing the remote work and trying to maintain a secure environment. Uh, uh, reactionary, um, you know, reactionary stances from businesses have been a concern. Uh, a lot of a lot of times they, you know, hey, well, not me. It's not going to happen to me. It won't happen to me. You kind of get that from a lot of business owners, and um, we try to pr provide them with this information, these metrics, the the top three biggest securities concerns, so we can say, hey, take a look at this information. We're trying to design a solution that is going to allow you to prevent this from happen, happening rather than reacting to this event after it happens. Um, certainly those are all uh, the major security concerns for us uh, and trying to implement a solution that, again, gives the user the ability to have frictionless access that's easy to use, but then also that it's the most secure that we can actually provide for them. So and, just, just, just to add to that, I mean, you know, on the password piece, um, one of the great things about about jump cloud is it offers sso for you know the the, the business applications uh and so it makes that much easier there are a lot of applications that just are not business applications but still pose a potential threat to the employee where they go on to the wall street journal or something like that and it's not something that's covered by sso and there's where you might um what we've seen work reasonably well is to have one of the kind of consumer oriented password, one password kinds of things and that you add on to the SSO. So the SSO is for 90% of the solution and then 10% for the uh, things that employees access um, that that um, are not covered by SSO. Yeah, I'll, I'll add on a little bit here. Like, I think in the wake of all the breaches this year, certainly in our industry as, as well as the IT industry, you get one side of the the you know the exact team saying hey we got to lock everything down we got to be super cognizant that we don't get breached ourselves and get the other one saying hey we need to make it super frictionless for our employees to be productive yep which one is it right and i think right you know, when, when you look at the things on the left here 
you have to choose which ones you're going to fight and which ones you're going to embrace. On secure networks, there's ways around that. There's there's VPNs. There's uh, you know all sorts of new technologies. Uh, you know, I've seen some enterprise customers that we work with ship SD WAN to the home. I think that's a little overkill, to be perfectly honest. I think you can solve that with a purely software approach. But then the other side, like security vulnerabilities, yeah, there's ways to solve that now. You can push that out. You can, now I'm not going to name vendors, but there's lots of ways to do it. Then it becomes a device access thing. And, I, and I'm sure I'm not as intimately as familiar with Jump Cloud, but like there's identity management and then there's device access, right? Yep. Do I only ever want you to do work on the, the machine that we provided you? Or do you want to enable, uh, you know, the MDM? Uh, that's that's a corporate policy, but then you have to embrace it. And I think, you know, again, try not to fight things, try to embrace them and try to work with them rather than against them. And that's kind of my point. That's just it. I, mean, I think to that point, one of the things that I, my understanding is, is is makes the life complicated are unmanaged devices. So, un, you know, when you bring your own, your spouse's desktop or your laptop or your, your daughter's or whatever, yeah. you know. That's a hard no. Uh, that, that just can't be. Uh, <laughs> and um, I think the things I, at least we've run into in terms of solutions for that. One is um, instantaneous, like like when you have an unmanaged device, uh, that when you try to access the environment, you get automatically downloaded a, a cloud-based BDI solution, uh, or automatically a browser that is actually managed. Um, by the organization rather than uh, on the device so that you you can only use that browser and it has all the permissions built into that. So there are ways to do it um, and there are vendors that can make this to do, but that is the real, from what we've seen, the biggest concern is unmanaged devices. Absolutely. So as we look at the rest of the year, and as we start thinking about, I mean, here we are, you know, two weeks from the end of the third quarter. Um, there's a lot left to do for everybody between now and the end of the year. Let's start thinking about the remainder of this year and all of next with a focus on security practices and remote work. What are your major plans for the rest of this year for your for your own customers or or for your own products? For for me, I would say, you know, MFA all day. That's what we we put that into a lot of our jargon mfa all day if it's if it's we can add mfa to it it will have it um encrypt like everyone is watching consider considering everyone is likely watching um we're rolling out conditional access uh to most of our clients and if you're not familiar with conditional access it's just allowing access based on a number of conditions being met meaning you know you're on the appropriate network you have the appropriate device you've authenticated properly you have MFA, okay, you can have access to this application that's controlled by an identity management tool like Jump Cloud. Um, we're training, lots of training. Uh, again, we keep finding the users keep clicking or making mistakes that the systems cannot get around. Um, and, you know, we're trying to coach our clients into embracing the change, okay? Don't be afraid of change. Uh, in IT industry, you know, we live in the nature is is definitely change. You know, it changes every couple of months in our industry. But a lot of the industries that we support, they're not used to that change. So don't be afraid of the change. Expect and prepare for the pivot and uh, get ready for what's coming next. Uh, listen to your managed services provider because we're trying to help you out. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that that's exactly it, right? Like, I mean, I think that this is why you have a managed service provider to provide you with good advice. Yeah. And, you know, to essentially say, look, we've got a solid finger on the pulse of the industry. Um, let's go someplace together um, based on all of that information. Can I, can Alex, I, what do you... Antonio's, can I tack on Antonio's point? Because I think it's, he's, he's dead on uh, 100%. I mean, so it's it's encryption, it's it's MFA, uh, and then it's access policies, which I, to my mind is one of the hardest things is, is like basically having the ability to put in place who has access to what in, in a simple way is not an easy thing to do. And you need, that's the middle piece between the encryption and the, and the MFA. And then there's one other piece for what, we've, what we're beginning to see for particularly important data that you really, really want to protect. Um, it's, it's um, if you will, account verification, where it's not just MFA, but it's, it's almost like an additional factor, which is to re-authenticate that you are who you say you are uh, and by using um, 
the camera in your phone, uh, and some of the, there are many vendors out here that are doing this now, uh, that basically reinforces the fact that, yes, you say you're Antonio Wynn, you are Antonio Wynn. Uh, uh, almost to authenticate that you are who you are, again, uh, as part of your MFA uh, effort. Mm -hmm. Alex? We, you know, we, we touched on the word MSPs. Uh, I've worked with thousands and thousands of MSPs over the last five, 10 years. Um, but I also work with a lot of corporate IT managers. And I think one thing that, you know, don't fear the MSP. Uh, like embrace it. There's some things that you as an IT leader inside your IT organization are going to be better than the MSP on. That's stuff that's critical to your business. You know your business better than anyone else. Managing the desktops, managing the infrastructure, that is something that a specialist, you can like, I'll just use the computer science to refactor. Take that, refactor it, bring in an expertise that, you, that complements you so that you have more time to focus on what's important to your business. Training your users, whatever that is, you know, like us as an organization, a couple hundred people scaling quickly. And it's like our IT team is focused on how do we support the needs of sales and marketing? How do we support the needs of product and engineering as opposed to is the network up? No, we, we've got a guy for that. <laughs> Embrace it, partner for it. It's a big point. Absolutely. I, so as we, you know, talk about security, one of the things that, you know, we didn't talk a ton about, or, but although we've kind of danced around it a little bit, is, you know, what's your approach for zero trust in 2021 and 2022? You know, we think about a place where, um, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about, you know, supporting devices anywhere. We've talked a little bit about supporting different methods of uh, authentication, depending upon your environment. What are you thinking about in terms of zero trust? And uh, Antonio, I'll start with you. Yeah, for me, zero trust uh, is literally that trust no one, trust no device. Um, I'm talking switches, routers, firewalls, um, not, not even your MSP. You shouldn't trust your MSP. You want to make sure that your MSP <laughs> has SOC 2, type except 2 R. You, except yours. You should certainly vet us. <laughs> you, exactly. You should certainly vet us. You want to make sure that we have SOC 2, type 2 audits, that our team is trained, that we're implementing the latest security standards and uh, best practices, that we are putting identity management in place to access your environment. You wanna make sure there's certain levels of controls in place between the MSP and yourself to make sure that uh, they are accessing, the people that are accessing your systems are approved. Uh, given the supply chain attacks that have happened lately, MSPs are targets. I'm just gonna be honest with you. So we, we spend a lot of time uh, and energy making sure that our clients are not susceptible to attacks based on our influence in their environment. Um, so yes, with, without question, for, for me, zero trust means trust no one at all, not even your MSP, and then putting controls in place to make sure that you can still get work done. It's just, I don't really trust you. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, what, what are you thinking about zero trust? I'll top that one, but, uh, but I would say that the only thing I, because I would say it's every person and it's every device that has access to the network and access to applications. So I would, I would completely second what, what Antonio said. I would add one more thing, which is this idea of continuously making sure it's a continuous effort. It's not, okay, you have access, you have access, you passed. It's uh, over a period of time, maybe you need to re-authenticate again and the device needs to re-authenticate again. If you really want zero trust, um, mm -hmm. would, would be the only, the only add, but I think Antonio nailed it. Alex, you guys have a really interesting product in this space. Tell me more about what your thoughts are on zero trust. Yeah, so, you know, will help you monitor and manage that network, but don't trust the network either. Um, yeah. Think about the network as you should mitigate east-west traffic. You should have nothing, no crosstalk. And if you think about, you know, let's just think of the traditional enterprise environment prior to COVID, people were in the office. When you clicked on that bad link, you got susceptible malware. You know how it spreads? It just looks left, it looks right, and it spreads from PC to PC. What if you stop that? If you treat everyone like an isolated VPN, and you go to the cloud and you come back down, hey, that last radius is now mitigated. So when we shift it all remote, okay, so yeah, maybe my machine got compromised, but like, what, what's it gonna talk to? Nothing. You know, my Apple TV sitting over here? No, like there's nothing it can talk to. So I think that again, in, in the spirit of just trust nothing, don't trust the network. You can use encryption, but you also wanna just prevent it from navigating across the network. And so we've been always talking about that, you know, big fans of Google Cloud Print, top, you know, products like that or solutions like that to prevent it from happening. Yeah. 
Uh, so there, there are, to your point, there are um, micro segmentation solutions out there uh, that I think do exactly what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, you know, like the old world of uh, network access control, I think that's dead. I, I think there's ways just to treat everything as its own segment. So like uh, most Wi-Fi, there is no crosstalk. You can't ping any other IP on the network. That's a good thing. Do that yep. for everything. Embrace it. Make yep. your on-prem server accessible through the cloud, and you have to go there and back. And, and, that's, and that would be where you would define permissions to go from one part of the network to the other. And so that would be in the control of the IT admins to do that. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so as we look at all of these things, you know, solutions can tend to cost money. Um, that is certainly something that we have to, to look at. We got to figure out what our budgets are as, a, as, an, as an organization. So how do all of the things that we've talked about so far roll into changes with IT budget and IT finance for uh, 2021 and 2022? So it kind of depends on where you start. I mean, if, if you know, if you've got everything that, you know, Antonio and Alex have talked about, you know, if, if, every, if everything's been deployed, or you've gone to an MSP and the MSP has all these things, then it's not going to affect your budget much. Uh, if you're starting from scratch, I think it's going to be it's going to be a challenge. Um, the good news is that most of these things are not capital intensive. They are operating operating expenses these days because they're mostly converted to uh, security as a service rather than right. rather than having to spend a whole lot of money on hardware. Uh, and um, so I, I think. You know where to start is is encryption software um, and uh, a really good directory uh, that manages uh, permissions very very well. And then I think to the points that everyone's made, uh, really comprehensive multi-factor authentication. And uh, I think I think we know who does that really well, which is Jump Cloud. <laughs> you know, I know that we're certainly very proud of our MFA efforts and Jump Cloud Protect, uh, you know, is is now out. Um, you can do a push, access, push uh, you know, message to get actually into your account. Um, and then, you know, we think about, you know, moving that to the login window. We should be seeing that within the next, you know, four weeks uh, so that you can essentially at that point do push MFA to the, you know, the login screen, um, which really kind of changes the game for everybody. Because that's yep. a much easier experience for the end users, which we've talked about. Right. Absolutely right. And, and here at Tom, I thought I was I was reaching and 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 hawking Jump Cloud too much, but then you came right in and beat me. <laughs> I'm not afraid to uh, talk about what I love about our product, Gary. Um, Antonio, so t tell me what you're seeing with your customers right now. How are they thinking about the next year for IT budget and finance? Well, um, budget and finance has been an interesting topic. Um, for our clients, because they were, were pivoting, and honestly, a lot of them were moving from the old kind of static Active Directory uh, monolithic block of directory services that isn't connected globally to Jump Cloud or tools like Jump Cloud, um, it's making sure that they understand that has a, a service attached to it and there's a there's an additional fee. Um, so for for us, has there been an increase in budget for our clients? Um, the with the number of you know, remote users and, you know, number of perimeters that we have to secure and the new technologies that we have to introduce. Fact is the, the, the charges and fees have gone up, but we're able to deliver the same kind of user experience and we're able to still secure those environments using those tools. So I, although the budgets and financing has gone up, we're still able to deliver the service level agreement that we originally proposed to our client. Um, so for us, yeah, they, they know that, but I think we've done a really good job of showing them the benefits and saying, hey, you know, the world has changed. Remember, embrace the change. It's time to pivot. It's time to introduce new tools and technologies. And you know what? Your workforce is actually more efficient from home now, we're finding. Um, they enjoy not having that commute. So a lot of our clients are actually starting to build in time for their staff to work remote and not have to drive in based on the implementations that we had to put in place very quickly because of COVID. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, I think of my own experience. Uh, I'm no longer on the road all the time uh, here in the greater DC area. I'm spending my time, you know, on meetings. I'm spending my time engaged with my coworkers. I'm spending my time, you know, writing papers and getting stuff out and, you know, built. And I don't have to worry about that. And it's given me so much more flexibility to be remote. So, Alex, how are you seeing this internally and externally? Yeah, so internally, you know, we have we have two two forces. How do we protect ourselves and be productive? 
And how do we think about scaling the business? I'll, I'll come back to Avi because it's probably less interesting than what we've been hearing from some of our larger customers. And that is budgets are increasing. You know, this is a this is a good survey, but it's like how is it increasing relative to the growth of the overall business? And what we've been hearing is, cool, we're dropping, uh, you know, we're dropping leases. We're dropping leases so that we can invest in newer technologies. Some of our larger customers still use desktops. And I was like, really? Like who uses a desktop anymore? Everyone has a laptop, but that is a capital expense that you need to finance. And, you know, it turns out money doesn't grow on trees. So you need to find that from somewhere in the overall corporate budget. So we're seeing reallocations there. Some are CapEx, some are OpEx to Gary's point, um, but it's more to embrace the environment. And as people go from fully remote to hybrid, you know, I think what we're actually gonna see in the IT thing is how do you enable experiences for people like you know we just we talked earlier about not having second class citizens that's going to be a challenge for IT because it means changing the way we we run meetings we run events we run corporate communications and the tooling will be different for that so i think you know the best is still yet to come here for in terms of change um but certainly more you know more normalization around tooling here mhm mm mhm mm Tom, I think, so, I, think we, I think we've learned a lot um, as, a, as a species, I think, almost forgetting just workers in terms of what it's been like over the past eight, 18 months. Um, and, and I guess one way to think about it, may not be the best way, is that um, we're all pretty productive if we all get into the same room. We're actually all pretty productive and maybe very productive if we're all on, remotely connected without having to commute, without having to travel, I think to Alex's and Antonio's points. Um, and what we haven't really experienced yet is what it's like when half the people are in an office and the other half are remote. And I think that's the challenge that we're, we're gonna face. I mean, there's been so much productivity that people talk about from this remote work. I mean, most CEOs that we work with say would say that they've, they get together every morning at 8 a.m. No one's traveling. Um, and uh, they are all on the same page by 8.30. Uh, and so, you know, they're, they're actually communicating and they're more, they're more bound together now than they've ever been. Um, uh, they're not commuting. Uh, and so there is all that. What you miss clearly is particularly for the younger, what we're seeing is particularly for younger people joining companies is they're not getting uh, they're not able to kind of get imbued with the culture uh, in, in a way that they otherwise would have. And I think that's a real concern for uh, a, a lot of companies. Um, and so my, I'm guessing that the way this works, you know, six months from now when Delta is handled and everyone's vaccinated or whatever, is, is um, that you'll have about half and half. I, I no idea. No one, I don't think, knows. But if I had a bet, I'd bet half and half. And then the question is, how do you set up an office? in such a way that everyone, to Alex's point of haves and have-nots, in, in a way that everyone is comfortable in communicating as, as well as, as possible. It could be big screens, um, but people are going to have to learn how to defer to people that are remote uh, equally as well as people that are, that are local. Like mm -hmm. we, we, had a, we had a team uh, in Spain uh, prior to COVID, and it, it was true. They had a terrible experience whenever we had meetings. We had our product management meeting, a couple guys on the wall bad experience. Now it's like, no, 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 everyone's on Zoom, everyone's on a laptop, that's great. But you know, like remote work isn't new. There are companies that are 100% distributed from day one and they make it work. And Gary, to your point about creating those, those experiences, bonds for, you know, maybe you call it the younger generation, whatever, the people who need that, that social time, there's ways to achieve it, to bring them together, both virtually and physically, whether that's in an office regularly, or you bring them together quarterly for an event. I think what we'll see, you know, what we're considering is either you're going to do regular events as a group to do team building, uh, you know, you're going to focus a lot more communication, or you're going to do the little micro events uh, in, in spaces. So, yeah, it's not like it hasn't been done before. It's just a lot to transition and it changes your culture a lot. Like we've, we'll lose people because of this. Everyone will lose people because that's not the style that they want. So it's a transition. Um, that's the reality, though. Yeah. The best phrase I've heard is that remote work is the, offering remote work is the new signing bonus. <laughs> exactly. 
from from so our no signing bonuses. Phew. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know simulating the banter around the the water cooler, simulating yep. that conversation is important to IT. There's a lot of problems that get solved just casually. Hey, what did you say? I heard you guys are having a problem with that network. Oh yeah, we solved that this way with this other client. You should check out this article or look at this knowledge based article. It's been a, a challenge to try to simulate that. Certainly there's been a, a, a increased effort and awareness by the leadership team to get people on more collaborative meetings, um, to get people into environments where we can still kind of talk and say, hey, what's what's going on? We're currently doing scrums every morning that are video scrums. Everyone has to participate just to talk about each each item and each task that each department is experiencing so that we can simulate some of that banter that you have around the uh, the water cooler. Yep. I would say that one thing, you know, in my role that I absolutely have not figured how to solve in this new reality is the conversation at the conference over a drink. You learn yeah. so much about the business struggles that you wouldn't get when I just say, hey, Antonio, you want to grab, you know, can we book a call just to chat? It's not the same as the the back and forth, uh, you know, where do you see the market going? What do you see? What products are you think are really cool? I haven't quite figured out how to solve that. Like virtual conferences just don't work for me in that respect, but maybe that's a me thing. And maybe I have to figure out how to adapt to that. New well, I, I think I think everyone feels the same way you do, Alex. I, I think that, that's, yeah, that, that's the myth, yeah. and the trade-off, right? I mean, for all the time you're not traveling and all the time you're not commuting, you give up that and, and you know, different people will weigh those trade-offs differently. Yeah, it's been a very interesting year in the Mac admin community in specific. You know, there's probably, I don't know, six annual conferences that kind of cover the entire world. And we haven't had a single one of them in person uh, since, you know, uh, you know, the late, uh, late 2020 at that point. Or I'm sorry, uh, late 2019. Right. Uh, and, you know, we think, sorry, the, the years all blur together. I know, they do. Thursday and <laughs> we're just off to the races. But, you know, there's this longing I can feel out there uh, within that community to get those people, to get those back on track and to figure out how we do those. And there, it's not that there haven't been, you know, in uh, online events, it's not that there haven't been great talks given in this period of time. It's just that they've all been remote and there's nothing to be to meet that conversation over a beverage at the end of the day, you know, uh, sitting in the corner pub around the corner from the uh, from the conference. And I'm really looking forward to getting back to those. Yeah, I, no, I, I, I think yeah. that I will tell you, most of the companies that at least I work with that used to have um, everyone travel to Las Vegas or everyone travel to. California, everyone traveled to Kiwa Island for a conference. They had their customer summits over the past two years or year and a half, uh, obviously virtually. And to the person, they've all said they will continue to do that when there's no longer a pandemic. They found it hmm. so much more productive. Um, and they believe, right or wrong, that the bulk of their customers, obviously not everyone, but the bulk of their customers preferred it to being in person. Now, there could be a, you know, a lot of different people have a lot of different perspectives on this, um, but th that's been the reaction of the companies that I deal with. Absolutely. And I, I kind of skipped forward the slide here because we just organically just started talking about how we create this balance, you know, sure. between the remote and in-person world. Um, and there's a lot of great stuff there. I do want to take a step back here and talk with you each about, you know, technologies that are still relevant or maybe even more important than ever now. Um, that are that you're working with every day that you that people may or may not have realized were so important. Phone calls. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> The yeah, telephone so, still works. I know. <laughs> you know, I find it interesting, uh, Tom, that when we were talking about creating the balance, we automatically shifted to the human factor and creating the balance with people. We didn't discuss the computers, the tools, the technology. It was how do we get team people to balance? Very interesting. Um, so as far as processes, I would say for us, you know, guys, the layered approach to security is still there. We still secure in layers, just the layers have kind of changed, you know? So we still have firewalls, but now we're adding MFA, we're adding conditional access and a lot of other tools to provide those layers. Uh, incident response planning, you're still gonna have incidents. You gotta do those, right? <clears throat> so make sure you have one in place. Um, a BCD uh, DR solution, business continuity and disaster recovery. Um, yeah, we still need to do those. So, <clears throat> excuse me, from our end, 
definitely you want to make sure that you're including all three of those. Mm -hmm. Alex, what are you seeing? Uh, you know, in terms of what's still a, a really key part of your arsenal. Uh, yeah, I think I'll echo everything that Antonio said. I think the big thing that we saw was the necess the necess necessity for increased communication. So everyone's got Zoom fatigue, but how else can you disseminate information? People like, you know, in the early days of a startup, you don't write anything down. Then you start to write things down, but then the quality isn't there. And then it really becomes, how do you disseminate information, help people understand, create that alignment when you don't get to see everyone anymore. It's a lot harder to build culture, to build process, to, to do all these activities you need to build a business, small or large, when you are remote. So it's just a different way of approaching it. And so we're using different tools to do that now. Uh, you know, it's, we, I don't know how many hundreds of SaaS tools we use, but we, but we have them there and they're different sets than they used to be. They're changing. Like, uh, we use Miro board, something I'd never heard of prior to the pandemic. I'm pretty sure everyone uses it now. Uh, I think it's a great collaboration tool when you're trying to play with diagrams. I think same, you know, zoom, we've done everything on zoom. Um, I'd say we're going to see more. I mean, this is nothing to do with what we do, but like more collaboration tools and some of them work. Some of them do not. Uh, some of them are just kitschy. Um, that's okay. It's we're iterating towards the final solution. Yeah, that's I, I exactly would, it. I, I would agree on the collaboration piece. And, and let's face it, there are some really big, really, really big software companies that really haven't solved the collaboration solution the way they should have, whereas others have. Uh, and and that I think is a challenge for those that are that have standardized on on one. Uh, very big one, uh, the, collab the, the spreadsheet collaboration, the word collaboration just isn't, isn't that great yet, and it, and it should be, frankly. Yeah, I think my, my more macroeconomic view is the barrier to create a SaaS business now is like zero. Uh, all the tooling is there. And so what we're seeing is, I'm calling them micro solutions to micro problems, the proliferation of SaaS, it's a challenge. It's a challenge that Antonio is going to have to deal with because there's tools that don't do uh, single sign-on yet or SAML or OpenID Connect, well, like pick your poison. But the proliferation, and it's too easy for someone to pick up a new tool. So I don't know how that's solved long-term, uh, but that's where you get data loss. Like, you know, if, if I'm collaborating on some new tool that no one's ever heard of and that gets breached, well, I might have some sensitive documents up there. I might have Credit card. Well, I would never put credit card information. I'm not that dumb. But like, you know, the, it, it's a slippery slope where, oh, interesting. Now I don't know where any of my data lives. It's no longer on my hard drive. Um, so, you know, I don't have an answer to that one other than there. You know, we're, I think we're going to have to put limits to what you can do as an individual. We we shifted all the power away from IT. That was really good. But it's like, mm, there's got to be an also there's got to be a balance between IT enabling the business and you know the the budget owners having the freedom they need to do to find the right solution to their problem so again i don't I have an answer there yeah i agree with you. i think i think one of the big questions that everyone i think i know i need to answer it is is do we allow unmanaged devices um to access anything that's important um and, and because if we if once if you if you preclude that then a lot of the concerns that you have that you just said which are real go away because you can manage that and and manage what what uh SaaS solutions they go to and which ones they don't go to uh but once you incorporate unmanaged uh, allow unmanaged it that's a whole nother that's a whole nother kettle of fish yeah i agree but you you, you can't stop me yet from signing up from an unknown SaaS solution and well, so well, what do we do with the unknown unknowns um collaboration tools that i'm just trying out with a buddy uh, using my work email address, yeah. sign into Google, or just even, they don't even have that yet. You just create an account. And by the way, I uploaded something and that's not okay. And mm -hmm. then you're into like web blocking and, and like really being, so like, I don't have an answer here. I think Gary, it's your point. You probably got to lock down the device, but a lot of it's training to Antonio's point about cybersecurity. It's like, just, you, you don't always need a new tool for that. Um, I'll tell you one story on training. I'll tell you one story on training. When I was at GE, we we deployed um, uh, phishing, uh, uh, basically training by showing people that if they hit the link when when they hit the wrong link, um, <laughs> that they hit the wrong link that 
they would take them to a website explaining why they should not have hit the link, right? I mean, that's a fairly common education tool out there now. And mm -hmm. I think it was something like 26% of the employees hit the wrong, hit the link when they shouldn't have. And so we did it again a month later and the same exact 26% yeah. <laughs> again. So that's the training challenge, is, right? Training's a challenge. <laughs> yeah. From, well, from, from our perspective, just one thing, guys, what we do with our clients is we won't allow them to onboard a new SaaS application unless we have vetted that application and we've confirmed they have a SOC 2 audit. They have to have uh, be integrated with a single sign-on solution, like an identity provider like JumpCloud. They have to use JumpCloud. We put a number of controls in place to just make sure that if we're supporting your environment and you're holding us accountable for your environment, the tools that you want to use to manage your business have to meet these certain criteria. Uh, otherwise, we're kind of we're not responsible for it. Yeah, that's, that's certainly awesome. helped. That's helped out a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly yeah, for helped sure. clear, the, clear the air. So let's pivot from here. We got a lot of really great questions in the Q and A box here. Um, so I think the 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 the, re, the good great place to start here is how do you get buy in from your users in this on the security training front? Because I I know that there are a lot of places that can see that as hostility uh, in, in, coming from IT. So let's talk about that process. For for please for for us we offer cybersecurity training for all of our clients. We switched to a new new tool that is very engaging. We've made the training uh, fun. So less about watching a static video that's droning over all the things you should not do. This new tool that we're using is uh, it's a cinematic kind of movie that you watch uh, that has questions at the end that you, that you answer and they send you an infographic later on. So I think, you know, there what we're trying to say is let's not be afraid of the change. Go out there and look for tools that are helping train users, but maybe train them in a different way. It doesn't have to be the old way. Um, that's for us, that's what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. Get, uh, Alex? I, I'd be curious who's reluctant at this point, like who hasn't clicked on the wrong link at some point, whether it's been a really bad incident or, oh, that looks like a phishing thing. I know I'm being fished. I think if you're not aware at this point, Maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm getting old and being curmudgeon but like, come on, <laughs> get on, get on with it already. Like you need to be trained. It's sort of like hygiene. Who doesn't mm -hmm. brush their teeth? Like, come on. So I, I, I don't have a good answer. I'm just ranting. So <laughs> I, I, I would say two things. One is these fishing education solutions. And you can actually do spear fishing and whale fishing uh, education too, where you, where you train people. Um, where it's highly personalized to the individual. You know, we know you were at so and so and so and so. So click here for feedback on this. And it turns out it was a fish, right? Because they saw on the web that you were there. So there are some ways that you can really scare the hell out of people by showing them uh, the reluctant ones, you know, how much they can learn about you and 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 trick you into clicking the wrong thing. So that there there is that. And then the second piece is I think what all three of us started out saying, which is you got to make the implementation of security solutions as friction-free as possible, uh, using biometrics. You, you know, you, you need multi-factor authentication. We all say it's the most important thing you can do, uh, but make it as easy uh, to use uh, at, as is possible. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so, and it's improved a lot. We used to have all these hard tokens we used to walk around with, uh, and uh, and and it's so much easier and better now. So it it should be able to do that. Well, let's turn the corner because, you know, I think that there's some other, you know, there's security fatigue out there as well in terms of just experience fatigue. And, then, you know, the question is, all this security sounds great. However, in today's climate with a, with a lot of instant gratification, how do we keep our customers, our users happy with being online all the time? All this security in my mind are all potential points of failure, not to forget IT manpower. Is there a happy medium here? Uh, just ask it again. In terms, happy meeting in sure. terms of how long we're online or how much security. I, we're on. Sorry. I think I feel like it's a little bit of both, right? Like we have, a, we're, we're essentially spending all of this time online, and that may may make some of our end users uncomfortable. Uh, and we also have a lot of security, and that can lead to a lot of security fatigue. Uh, you know, I, I realized the other day before I bought a Touch ID keyboard that I was typing in my login password more than thirty times a day, yeah. because our screensaver policy is so short. 
Right. So, you know, I thought I thought about that and I was like, fine, I am going to go buy a Touch ID keyboard so I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great solution because I have one too. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> I run lid shut all day. It's amazing. How, how does this work? I explain this. The, one. Uh, the, well, the fin- like on the Macs, you have a fingerprint sensor, and then you just you just yep, log in so with your fingerprint. But then here's my it, fingerprint on my external keyboard. Yeah, and then you log once you reboot, you got to put your real password in. And then you got to yeah. authenticate your SAS apps. So I think what you're seeing, I mean, that's exactly the that's the fatigue. Yeah, no one wants a one minute screensaver policy unless you can make it frictionless. So that is the perfect example of how technology can help appease. Uh, you know, like we use uh, for, we use one password here at Ovid for like personal stuff or uh, applications. It's so integrated into my browser. It's just so easy to use. Why wouldn't you use it at this point? And I think in the old days when it was a separate app and it's just like, it was cumbersome. Now it's just like, it's autofill. Like that is how you get over that is you make it like it's a no op for a user. And that, again, to my earlier pointer, it takes some iteration to figure out where, where the friction is. I remember my old IBM from a decade ago had the old fingerprint swipe. It was so life-changing in windows. It was so great. Um, they thought, and I think what you're saying is a combination of SSO for the business driven applications and then a, a, a password manager for the things that are not business oriented. You gotta make them easy, right? And so what one password's done yeah. really well is autofills. You have to yeah. authenticate once and it integrates into my touch ID sensor as well. So it says, hey, do you want to fill in my bank password or something? I'm a bad example. Fingerprint, done, move on. Because right. uh, my it. bank password, what, like this long? I don't know. Um, you know, one thing that hasn't really hit yet is it's funny is for your phone, you can use face recognition as, as an authenticator. But I don't think yet Windows has authorized that for, or Mac for desktops. I so mean, there is Windows Hello on the Windows side, and okay. there are some things that you can do with facial geometry biometric scanners there. Um, it's not as full featured or as secure as something like a secure enclave based solution. But I do know that most of that solution does reside in the TPM on the Windows side. So it's it's yeah. in a secure space. So that, uh, that, is that, it might be a way, that might be a way to deal with it as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think IT guys, you know, have been in, in on this side of technology for a long time, the IT side. We have to stay engaged in the business and make sure that we're not putting in controls that are limiting the business <laughs> being able to function. A lot of times from our side, we get so wrapped up in the con- security control and the layers, and we're so accustomed to going past all these different layers to get to our work uh, environment. The business is not. So leadership has to stay in tune and say, okay, what do you think about this technology and what's the risk mitigation? What's the risk of not doing this? It's very important because in an ideal world, for me, honestly, everything locked down is great, but that's not feasible. It's not going to work. So you have to stay engaged with leadership in the business and make sure you're Such making appropriate point. decisions. Such a big point. Yeah. Because sometimes you you, if you make it so locked down, people, the creative ones are the ones that are going to figure out how to get around it. And that's when they get in trouble. <laughs> key takeaway for me is I need to print a Gary mask for me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But you, but you have Gary's 100% right. Like, you go too far, then I'm just going to go use a different computer. Like, screw this. Right. It's that's not right. productive. Yeah, for me. Right. yeah Shadow IT it. gets to be a, a solution yeah. at that point. And don't get in my way. Not, Help yeah. me. That's right. Uh, another question I think this may be our last. We're running out of time, but this one's really important. How do you preserve talent now? Uh, remote work has led to less personal communication and less personal attachment to your work. People join and move without any kind of second thought. It's harder to keep talent now. How do we cope with this? Yeah, it is Tough very one. hard. It is very hard. So from our side, guys, and we've been instructing a lot of our um, the clients that we support, creating a, a really good culture within your environment. You know, you can throw money at people all you like, but what it, what it comes down to is... Um, what kind of culture do you have? How how are you are you really listening to your staff? Are you trying to include them in the in the business making decisions and make them feel like they're a part of the team? Because anyone can shop around and look for a dollar. You, got, you usually want that person to move on anyway because they're they're trying to find a nugget somewhere. But if you're creating a really good work culture, a really good environment where people feel like they're a part of the team and that they're part of the company and they're part of the company's direction, that's hard to simulate. So anything that you can do to make your your environment special 
to make someone feel like, man, I just really love that company. You should do that. Yeah. I'm going to tack right on to, I'm going to tack right on to that, Antonio, because I agree, I agree 100%. I've always, having seen some, some, what I consider to be really, really great leaders, they, they, they all had, um, this in common. They were one really good at their job. They're really good at selecting good people. They're really good at making good decisions. They're really good at um, having a vision and really good at communicating on the one hand, but there was a second thing they all had. And it really gets to what Antonio is talking about is they convinced you that they cared about you personally. And that's really, really important. Not as ubiquitous as, you, as you'd like it to be from, from as, as a leader. Uh, and a little bit harder to do in a remote world than it is in an on-prem world. Um, but I think those two things remain the critical things and you just, as a leader, you have to figure out how to, how to make up for that in a virtual world. Yeah, so I think that's something that, you know, myself and the leaders that work with me have been thinking a lot about, which is what is our USP? When we are going out to try and bring, sell our business to attract talent, what will we give you that nobody else can? Somebody will always pay more money. What can we give you? And I think what we're coming to the conclusion is we can give you an awesome experience. We can help you become that P70, P90 person through development programs, through training, through coaching. We are going to invest heavily in management, management controls to help you as an individual become really good. I expect you to stay two and a half, three years, and I expect you to graduate from Avic and move on. I want you to graduate and move on. Go get the next job. Be a you know chief architect somewhere. I don't expect you to stay here forever. That is a very different culture than oh, I want to pick top one percent in the world and pay them a ton of money and have them work here for the rest of their life. Like that's just so different. And so I think, what is your identity? What can you give them that no one else can? And then double down on that. And I don't, you know, what I just shared is something that we haven't we haven't gone all in on yet. We're still trying to figure out if that's the right thing, but it's. What makes us, what can we give you that no one else will? Mm -hmm. Not that so, we're here and this is the only job you can get. Like that, those days are gone. <laughs> That's absolutely true. I mean, there's functional unemployment, there's functionally 0% unemployment in IT right now. Um, there are way more openings than there are people to fill them all the way down to the help desk level. And, you know, it, it is such a challenge right now. And what you've got to do is be something special, be something different. And that matters. Or jazz hands. Jazz hands! <laughs> I'm down. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. It's been an incredible opportunity to talk with you all. Gary Reiner, Operating Partner at General Atlantic, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank all, thank all, all, all three of you. Uh, great discussion. Really enjoyed it. Alex Hoff, uh, CPO at Avic, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, a pleasure. This was fun. And Antonio uh, Wins, CEO of Synac Finn in Denver, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you guys so much. This was a pleasure and very fun conversation. Absolutely. By the way, and I, I have to comment. I love your company name, Antonio. Very few people will get it. If you need some help, Reach out and I'll explain it. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And of course, thanks to everybody at Jump Cloud for uh, producing this webinar. We've got a great one coming up in two weeks that's the sequel to this one. Um, the sequel that we're working on to this one, which is going to be a deeper dive into the day to day uh, in a new environment. So uh, please head out and sign up for that webinar. Um, it's going to be, you know, with another great group of panelists. Uh, my colleague David Worthington is going to be leading. He's amazing. Uh, and we'll be thrilled to see everybody there. Uh, thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. And uh, thanks so much. Thank you, Tom, very much. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Please subscribe and check out more content from us.